Welcome to lesson 13. In this lesson, we'll continue with exploring chapter 4, choosing understandable names. Now, obviously, names shouldn't be too long or too short. Long variable names are tedious to type, whereas short variable names can be confusing or mysterious. And because code is read more often times than it's written, it's safer to err on the side of too long variable names. So let's take some look at uh, some examples of names that are too short and too long, starting with variables that are too short. Now, the most common naming mistake is choosing names that are too short. Short names often make sense when you first write them, but their precise meaning can be lost a few days or weeks later. Uh, let's consider a few types of short names. The first is a one or two letter name, uh, like G or, I don't know, M, M-O, something like that. Now, a short name like that probably refers to some other word that begins with the letter G, but there are a lot of words that begin with G. So acronyms and names that are only one or two letters long are easy for you to write, but difficult for someone else to read. And this also applies to an abbreviated name like MON. Now, MON could stand for monitor or month or, I don't know, monster any number of words. So this variable name is too short. Go ahead and write out the full word. And even then, when you write out a single word name, that can be too short. Let's think of a variable like start. Uh, well, the start of what? What exactly does this variable refer to? Now, names like this could be missing context that isn't readily apparent when somebody else reads it. Now, these short names might be understandable to you, but you always need to keep in mind that other programmers, or even you yourself a few weeks into the future, are going to have difficulty understanding their meaning. And there are some exceptions where short variable names are fine. For example, it's common to use i, which stands for index, in a for loop, something like i in range 10. And if you have nested for loops, it's really common to have j, since it's the letter that comes after i, or k. These are examples of single letter variable names that are fine. Another example is using x and y for Cartesian coordinates. That's a really common single letter variable name. That's fine. Um, you could also possibly use w and h to stand for width and height, but in, in this case I would say probably width and height, the full names, are a lot better than w and h, or even better, the width of the thing that you are measuring, sort width of house, height of house even. Now next, don't drop letters from your source code. This was really popular in variable or function names like memcopy, which stood for memory copy, or strcomp which stood for string compare. These were really popular in the C programming language before the 1990s, but it's a really unreadable style of naming that you shouldn't use today. If a name isn't easy to pronounce, then it isn't easy to understand. Now, additionally, feel free to use short phrases that can make your code read like plain English. For example, you could have number of trials, which is a lot easier to understand than simply number trials, which could be slightly ambiguous. Now, there are times when you can have names that are a bit too long. And one of the most frequent occurrences of this is when you have an unnecessary prefix in the name. Let me open up a file editor right here. So say that we have a cat class. Now, I could create an attribute for the weight of the cat, and I could call it cat weight. Maybe something like this. Of course, since the name of the class is cat, and so this is a cat object, having the additional prefix right here, cat, is actually somewhat redundant. So we don't actually need this. In this case, just the simple word weight would probably be adequate enough. We would have cat object dot weight, so that is clearly the weight of the cat. Uh, similarly, there's an old and now obsolete practice 
called Hungarian notation, and this is the practice of including an abbreviation of the data type in names. Uh, for example, you could have a variable named stir name to indicate that this variable contains a string, or i vacation days, and the i stands for integer, and this is the integer number of vacation days that you have. Now modern languages and IDEs can relay this data type information to the programmer without the need for these prefixes. So Hungarian notation is pretty much an unnecessary practice today. On the other hand, is and has as a prefix is often fairly useful for creating readability. Uh, consider the following example. If we have a variable named isVehicle and a method named hasKey, have if item under repair, let's say this is some sort of dictionary object. The has key method really helps make this read like plain English. If the item under repair has a key, tires. And then we could have a variable name called is vehicle, which could contain a Boolean value, say. That's a really common thing to store in variables that begin with is. So this says, is this a vehicle? And then we could have this as true or false. Similarly, adding units to your names can provide useful information. Uh, let's say we had a weight variable and it stores some floating point value. Now, is this weight in pounds or is it in kilograms? That's not really given from just the variable name and even the data type of the value it stores. So it might be prudent to just include something like kg at the end to specify that this is in kilograms. This is not the same thing as Hungarian notation because this isn't information about the data type, which is floating point, but rather additional descriptions of what that floating point number means. And this can be very important. In 1999, the Mars Climate Orbiter robotic space probe was lost when software supplied by Lockheed Martin produced calculations in Imperial Standard units, whereas NASA's software systems used metric and this resulted in an incorrect trajectory, and the spacecraft crashed and burned, and uh, reportedly cost $125 million. So that is a big software mistake that could have been fixed just by having more readable code. Another example of variable names that are too long is whenever you have sequential numeric suffixes in the name. Let's say you have a variable called payment1, And you also have other variables like this called payment2, has some other number, payment3, payment4. Now variable names like this don't tell the person reading the code what the difference is between these payment values. Now is this payments for the four quarters in a year, or are these just subsequent payments made? What's the difference between payment2 and payment4? If you ever find yourself writing variables like this, probably a better idea is to just create one variable named payment and then have it store a list or a tuple with the values stored in it. Now there's a little bit more that you should know about coming up with good names for these variables and function names, and we'll go into that in, in the next lesson.